Thank you very much, architect. Thank you. That's, that was a very quick one. Thank you. <laughs> like it. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. And I welcome you here today. My name is Neil Dweyamo. I'm the president and chair for the Ghanaian Canadian Chamber of Commerce and also the president and CEO of Reality Capital Management, an accounting firm located here in GTA. I'm very excited and honored to be here today to be the MC for today's post-summit Friends of Africa program with the featuring our guest note speaker, His Excellency John Mama, the former president of the Republic of Ghana. Our chief guest needs no introduction. He's a well-recognized figure. Um, he's known for his wonderful administration and many accomplishments as president of Ghana. He's an historian, a writer, and a communication specialist. Please welcome His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, the former president of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you. We are very, very privileged and honored to have you here today. Thank you, sir. Also, today in our midst, we have the Honorable James Quaison. Bring us. We are very honored to have you here, sir. We also have today, as you look around, we have leaders of thought, government officials, investors, Canadian influencers, including the Honorable Jean Augustine, first female black MP, cabinet member, and deputy speaker of the House of Commons in Canada. Yes, we also have Professor Wendy, former VP of the University, Arising University, now Toronto Metropolitan University, founder and academic director, um, diversified institution and also is a professor of entrepreneurship all at the University of Toronto Metropolitan University. We also have the president of Casa Foundation. She's here. Um, we have members and advisory council of Casa Foundation. We have the president of the Ghanaian Canadian Association of Ontario, Mr. Dodu, is here. We, we, are, we also have members of the Ghanaian Canadian Chamber of Commerce, our host. They are all here. So once again, I welcome everybody for joining us this morning. We are very excited and thrilled, as I said before. In addition to all these eminent people here today, once again, I welcome you all to this interesting and meaningful experience of life this morning. Please, as we settle down, um, and before we dive in, I would just like you to know that um, we have some few housekeeping things to let you know. The restrooms um, are on the highway, I'm sorry, on the hallway and on your right hand side. Sorry, <laughs> on the hallway on the right hand side. Um, we also have, um, in case of emergency, um, you follow the exit signs as you look around. Um, in case of fire, you follow the exit sign. No smoking is permitted in these premises. Thank you very much. Um, as we move on the program, as you are aware, um, it's going to be a quick program, like I said. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jane Augustine to give a welcome speech. Uh, we cannot think of anybody so qualified to do this for us today. As I can emphasize, she's the first female federal minister. Um, she's been a member of parliament until 2006. Um, she's also the founder of the Jane Augustine Center for Girl Power, uh, Empowerment of the Girl Child. So please, let's give her a round of applause as she joins me on the project. Thank you so much, Doctor. Merci beaucoup, Professor. <laughs> Excellency, elected representatives, officials, CASA, and Friends of Africa. Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Ghanaian Canadian Chamber of Commerce, who are partnering and collaborating with us today. Good morning. <laughs> Bonjour. A 
it is great to welcome you here. It's great to have you at this post conference. It is also, I think I must say something, two things that's important to say uh, these days when you get to the microphone. One is acknowledge that we are sitting and we are growing and we are developing on the land of indigenous peoples. And the second thing, Excellency, that we speak about all the time is the weather. <laughs> and so we've been preparing the weather for you. <laughs> we've held off the snow, can't do anything about the rain, but I'm sure you know the story. We've come through a very successful conference. The speakers, all those who were part of workshop sessions, fireside sessions, all inspired and energized us. And we were energized by your presentation on Zoom. Again, we live in the world of social media. And so you came across as though you were in the room with us. So it's very, I'm very pleased to meet you in person. I won't kind of drag your memory. I'm 86 years old now, and I, um, I forget things and places. But I remember meeting you in 2019 um, at this great big uh, event uh, in your country, I don't remember the name of the place right now, but um, we had brought, or we came and shared in all of the cultural activities, um, and that day you were there. Oh, my group was all excited, there were 23 of us, and you were walking around, shaking hands, and we were pushing ourselves forward so that you would come to us, and somehow you kept on going, and we were so disappointed. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to see you here in person. I also want you to know, in the couple minutes that I have, I want you to know that Africans and Ghanaians in particular are making huge contributions to Canadian society. We are this diverse, multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious society. And it is the vibrancy of people of African descent, like myself, and other Africans that are making that contribution to make Canada the boast that Canada makes around the world about its diversity. We are struggling around the issue of inclusiveness. So we recognize that we are diverse. Now, how do we include Every, everyone in the discussion and in the workings of the society. And so the work that FORA does, the work that all the folks in this room, the associations and whatnot, the churches and others, they're working towards making the society that we want, a society where everyone can reach their full potential and that as entrepreneurs, as business people, as, as um, educators, etc. Um, professor mentioned that I had a Center for Young Women's Empowerment. And who do you think is my executive director? A young Ghanaian woman, energetic, bright. She's leaving me though. She spent seven years and she's found a bigger organization and bigger money in. So <laughs> I'm letting her fly her wings. <laughs> so I'm looking, for, I'm looking for an executive director and I'm sure someone will come from our community. I was uh, recently at three conferences and I want to mention that. One was um, Black um, Physicians of Canada and there were about 300 black physicians around. It just blew my mind, because when I came to Canada in 1960, I can count on the fingers of one hand the black doctors. And there we were, 300 of them in a room from all across Canada, 
That was just mind-boggling. And the young people who are going through the system, through medical schools and what, all African. And um, I don't want to disappoint you, but more Nigerians than that. <laughs> I'm only teasing you. I don't want to start any war. <laughs> But um, the young Africa, especially, and for the men, I need you to know this, young African women, they are women, so uh, making their mark, <laughs> making their mark. And the strength of Canada now, and the strength of Canada to be, we find in the energy of those young women. So welcome. Excellency, welcome members of your delegation and all those who are participating with us um, from the Friends of Africa. I now say to you again, welcome and let's continue to work to build a society that, and not for a better world, better community, better environment for all of us, and keep sending us Ghanaians, please. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Augustine, for your kind words and for gracing the stage for us today. We are so excited to have you here. May I now introduce to you our visionary leader, the president and CEO of CASA Foundation and partner of MCAP, Dr. Olutoin Oyalade. Dr. Olu, I'm pleased to have you on the stage. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Your Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Ghana, uh, members of Parliament here present, esteemed constituents and uh, party leaders, the Honorable Jean Augustine, the first black woman member of Parliament, black uh, female cabinet member, and the first deputy speaker of the House of Commons in Canada and proud to call you a member of the advisory board of the CASA Foundation. Thank you again. <laughs> Our mentors, academic partners from the Toronto Metropolitan University, uh, Professor Wendy Shukir, members of the Ghanaian Canadian Chamber of Commerce, all small and medium enterprises, founders, business owners, esteemed delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope I've covered you all, um, all protocols observed. Welcome again to this post-summit Friends of Africa edition um, 2023. It's such a honor, it's such a privilege to join you this morning. Indeed, it is a blessing of providence to welcome in person His Excellency um, into our midst today. He is a man of his word. Um, we got the promise that although he wasn't able to join us in person at the Friends of Africa Economic Summit for 2023, but at any time he's in Canada, he would make an attempt at least to make, it, you know, to make himself available to us. And that's exactly what he has done today, a man of his words. Thank you again, Mr. President, for joining us. At CASA Foundation, we're full of gratitude, not only because we just celebrated the 13th edition of the Friends of Africa Economic Summit, and its great impact on communities, but also because of the rare opportunity to be supported by an ecosystem that prioritizes the advancement, the advancement of its constituents, advancement of our businesses, advancement of entrepreneurs, advancement of professionals and the people in our midst, and the people that we're grooming you know, at, at different stages, uh, life cycles of their businesses. Uh, we're really proud to be connected to each one of you in the room today. Uh, particularly because as a result of your connections and your contributions and your collaborations with each one of us in our group, in the past 14 months, it's been so exciting to see the development of new businesses, entrepreneurs, 
and the innovators and inventors in our midst. Uh, small businesses now from the BIPO community are not only rising, but they are also creating solutions for the Canadian National Economy of Canada. They are making their impact felt in the kind of opportunities and the businesses that they are running. And I dare say that it's one of the reasons that the Federal Government of Canada in 2021 actually announced the Black Entrepreneurship Program, a total of $401 million, and decided to take a leap of faith on us, the black community, to manage our own money given to us by the federal government, by ourselves, by our people. And so 30 organizations, including Casa Foundation, received the $401 million in 2021. And so this is a huge, huge progress. It's the first, uh, it's the first, ty first time, first type of funding coming from the federal government. Of course, there have been various grants and all of those, but this one is specifically tagged the Black Entrepreneurship Program. 30 organizations appointed to manage the 401 million, including 192 million in loans. It's called the Black Loan Fund, and we're all, uh, uh, it's made available to every business within the black community only. And so I believe that that's kudos to the work that ecosystem partners like yourselves in the room today have been doing over um, the, the past few months. All right, again, I say that Casa Foundation was the only organization that presented nine black African organizations to the federal government of Canada to receive the approval to manage this particular funding, including the Ghana Canadian, Ghanaian Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And so uh, Casa Foundation went as a lead organization, but uh, wanted to take as, as many as possible. The Malian Chamber of Commerce, the Malian Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Moroccan um, Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Rwandan Canadian Chamber of Commerce, all led by Casa Foundation to receive this, to show ourselves as ecosystem partners and that we can actually find a way to collaborate and to make things happen in Canada because no single person can do it alone. And that's the power of an ecosystem. Mr. President, and our esteemed audience, it is the resilience of such black SMEs that we've been grooming within this black ecosystem hub that we now manage, uh, who have chosen to chart the course, the course of their own destiny, uh, chart their own path in life. Uh, the resilience is what continues to motivate us, what continues to give us the impetus to move forward and to do much more for our community, for the constituents that we manage, and to demonstrate that we actually do have the capacity from where we're coming from, that we actually do have the competences and the skills to do so much in a country like this. Yes, indeed, it's a foreign land. Yes, indeed, we do have a lot to contribute. We brought value to the table. We are migrants of destiny, and nobody can ever put it out on us, despite and in spite of the challenges that we're faced with on a daily basis, the isms that we all hear all around us, from the racism to the nepotism to the schisms in our midst, ageism, sexism, whatever it is, whatever it is that anybody is doing to dampen our morale, what thing for sure, we are one community, we may be divided, tribes, several cultural divergences and all of those, but we're one. We're one. We must demonstrate that we're one. And through the examples of the ecosystem partners that we bring to the table from time to time, we show them that we're one. And that's why we're really, really um, thankful, yes, on one hand to the federal government for doing this, but more importantly, building ourselves together, the skills and the competences that we need to gain to show them that we can actually manage great things in a country like this. And so, I conclude this morning to say, our power as a community lies in our ability, not only to create an ecosystem of support, but to demonstrate the fact that we can also solve problems. Solve problems. And those things that have been termed challenges of our times, they become opportunities for us to turn them around and show that solutions can actually come and that the black community, particularly the black African community, can contribute to Canada's national economy. Um, at some point today, uh, we should be having a, a fireside chat, so some of the questions that you have, we collated during the Friends of Africa, we'll be able to present those 
to His Excellency and see how he's able to maybe address some of the concerns that you showed and some of the issues affecting us as a people first and foremost. And uh, I, I know for sure that the, the Mr. President is a Pan-Africanist and I do believe that he will be able to speak even to some of the other challenges that some of the other African groups in the room today um, perhaps have brought to the room. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, thank you so much for listening and I welcome you again, Mr. President, and your delegates. Thank you. Wow. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, President of Casa Foundation, Dr. Olu. We are so, as, uh, as you can see, we are right on time. We're following the time and we are solid on the time. I'm so excited. At this point, um, it is my greatest honor and privilege to welcome His Excellency John Dramani Mahama to the stage just to discuss with us sustainable economics development through entrepreneurship and partnership, reforms that will address economic crisis and um, help us understand. I think he did that for us before in the, on the uh, video call, but he's here in person today. So we are excited to have him here. Please put your hands together and let's welcome our guest of honor, the Honorable His Excellency John Dranmani Mama to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to interact with you directly and personally. Um, of course, technology makes it possible for us to be able to. Can I get rid of this <laughs> jacket? <laughs> technology makes it possible for us to be able to interact even, even from a distance, but. Um, there's nothing as beautiful as cozying up together, sharing coffees, and talking directly to each other. And so, good morning again. And um, let me thank Lady for the very kind words she, she spoke. And um, something interesting happened. I was invited to, the reason I'm in Canada is I was invited to give a lecture at um, a conference of universities studying slavery. And I was supposed to talk about slavery and colonialism. And um, when I arrived, my host welcomed me at the airport. It was a lousy day. It was raining. It was cold in Halifax. And um, I told them I had packed a sliver of sunlight and that it was arriving on Air Canada. So I'm sure that the sun was going to shine. And um, I was joking. But the next morning, the sun came out bright and beautiful. And they were all congratulating me for bringing the sunlight. And I said, unfortunately, I didn't bring enough. I brought enough to last just for the weekend. And so, <laughs> and again, when I was leaving on Saturday and I was going to the airport, it was raining and miserable and cold. And they said, oh, you're taking your sunlight back to Africa. <laughs> no, so thank you very much. And I'm happy uh, to be here. My understanding was to make a few remarks about economic challenges and opportunities in, in Africa. And so I'll just speak randomly and um, I guess that maybe if there's an interaction afterwards we can flesh out some of the issues that are raised. <coughs> I studied history for my first degree and so often I like to start my discussions from a historical perspective. And um, that is to do with Africa's development as kingdoms. For those who know, who have read the history of Africa, Africa, Africans lived in kingdoms. And so we had the Great Ashanti Empire, we had the Benin, the Dahomey Empire, we had Songhai, we had Mali Empire, and so many of them. And then all these empires at their peak, you know, were in control of commerce and trade within the African region. And for those of you who have read about the Trans-Saharan trade, there was a trade that developed even before the trade across the Atlantic, where items from India, spices, you know, items from the Middle East, Arabic books, perfumes and things, were brought across the Sahara and traded for products that came from the Sahara, especially gold. 
and some other uh, such, such products. And so that trade had existed. And then the first um, Europeans arrived on the west coast and um, Ghana has one of the forts where the Portuguese landed first and it's called Elmina. And so from that point trade changed to trade across the Atlantic and um, items from Europe and other places were brought to Africa in exchange first for gold and other uh, products of, um, the, of Africa. But then eventually that trade turned into a more lucrative one, which was a trade in human beings, and that's the slave trade. And um, our people were physically removed and uh, brought overseas. Um, one of the things that surprised me in Halifax, I hadn't really, you know, thought that Canada had a history associated with the slave trade until I went to Halifax. When you think about the slave trade, you think about the Caribbean, you think about Southern, uh, South America, the southern part of the USA, Tennessee, Alabama, and all those places. You never really think that there is a history associated with the slave trade and Canada. And I found all that out in Halifax especially. Indeed, Halifax was one of the original roots of slaves returning back to Africa to found the colony of Freetown, which is Sierra, Sierra Leone uh, today. And so those were all um, interesting discoveries for me. After the slave trade and the profits that were being made out of the trade of human beings, there still had to be a way of expropriating the wealth that Africa had. And so, so the slave trade was replaced by colonialism. And at the Berlin Conference, I mean, Africa was like a cake that was being divided up amongst uh, its, uh, those who were going to eat it. And um, it was apportioned. Germany took its share, England took its share, uh, France took its share, uh, Spain, and all of them. And if you look at the map of Africa, we are 54 nations. And we all have had different colonial experiences from Portuguese to Spanish to English to French and everything. And for a long time, our economies have been ordered in the direction of what our colonial experience was. And so the Francophone, you know, have a direct connection with the metropolis, which is France the British with England, the Spanish with Spain, the Portuguese with Portugal, and so on and so forth. And so all the trade routes and everything have been based on, on that. One would have thought that once we gained independence, and that was the excitement of becoming independence, that we we're going to be able to manage our own affairs. But one of our former presidents and Pan-Africanist, Dr. Nkrumah, said that we had only emerged from colonialism into new colonialism. They didn't need to come in and slave us and carry us away physically. They didn't need to come and rule over us and take our gold and our cocoa away. But you would bring it yourself and you will export yourself. You enslave yourself and export yourself, you know. And of course that's what we're seeing now. The trade routes are directed to the metropolis, so cocoa still goes, you know, uh, directly onto the European uh, markets, and from there it is redistributed across the world, and then um, everything else is what it is. We are still primary producers, and so even though Africa is the richest continent in terms of natural resources, it unfortunately does not have the privilege of adding value to whatever it produces. And so the gold goes out as raw bullion, the cocoa goes out as raw beans, the copper goes out as raw copper, and all these processes take place in other advanced countries and creating jobs outside of Africa. Now, the combination of, of this creates, creates a toxic cocktail in the sense of the fact that Africa is the fastest growing continent in terms of population. And so Africa has the largest, youngest population in the world. And because Africa does not have the advantage of the economic prosperity that is brought from adding value to whatever you possess, then it means that fewer opportunities are being created for our young people to be able to go ahead. And that's why many are voting with their feet and migrating, even through dangerous routes like crossing the Sahara, 
crossing the Mediterranean. Many of them have drowned and died. And yet, but yet, I mean, it's better to go search for those greener pastures and look for places where opportunities exist than to sit at home and not be able to uh, discover your full potential. And so one of the things that we need to do is to reorder these economic relations. And those are some of the things that we have started to look at. Because in the beginning, one of the main reasons was you don't have the technology, you don't have the capital. But today, you can buy the technology, you can, buy, you can, you can uh, get the capital. And so, for instance, I'll give you an example. We had the um, State Gold Mining Company in Ghana. And State Gold Mining Company was running at a loss. It was set up by Kwame Nkrumah. And they uh, say, so no, no, World Bank and IMF come and say, no, you need um, foreign direct investment. You need to bring partners in from outside. And so you must divest these loss-making state enterprises. And so we sell State Gold Mining Company for $5 million. And <coughs> Goldfields buy the State Gold Mining Company. And there's a tailings. <coughs> when we talk about tailings, it means a huge mountain of uh, ore that has been processed in the past. In the past, because the technology was not there to process the ore properly, they could take out only 45% of the gold. The remaining almost 50% of gold was in there in the tailings. And so what happens? Investor comes, brings the machine, puts it there, takes our tailings from Gordon Gagisbeck's time, the colonial period, and just washes and takes out the remaining 55%, makes some tens of millions of dollars, takes out five million and pays uh, Ghana for the, the, the concession. And today, that mine is the richest mine in Ghana, turning over billions, more than... Thank you. Well, turning over billions of dollars, a mine that was bought for five million. But today, there are Ghanaian companies that have the technology to be able to do that mining. Indeed, if you look at most of the big mining companies, the subcontractors are Ghanaian. And so the blasting, the drilling, the hauling, all the way to the crashing plant is done by Ghanaians. And so all the investor does is he sits at the end, and then when it has been crashed and gold is washed out, then they do the bullion, and then it's exported. But even then, it's not refined. It is exported raw. And so the difference between raw gold and refined gold, not to even talk about going beyond refined, to jewelry, is exponential and all that value sits outside Africa and so it makes it an, an impossible for us to create the kinds of opportunities that our people need. So what am I suggesting? I suggest that we should vary where the, the, the kinds of investments available to us. Foreign direct investment is important. Capital is important and you can find capital outside in Canada in many parts but I think that we must do this in partnership recognizing that the capacity exists indigenously to also do some of these things and so we can exploit more from the diaspora they are now significant uh, uh, funds that are held by Africans in the diaspora why don't we have a database of this and see how we can get them to take more interest in investments in, in Africa. And so that's one of the things that you look at. Aside from that, we should also promote indigenous entrepreneurs, indigenous capital in Ghana, in, not in Ghana, in Africa. Because what I notice is because we want to attract foreign direct investment, we give all the incentives to the foreigner when he comes. And yet, the same investment is the same investment that an indigenous businessman is making. And yet this one gets all the tax exemptions, he gets all the tax holidays, but if you're an indigenous company, you have to start paying taxes, you, must, you don't get any exemptions for any investments that you make. And so that discrimination between indigenous capital and foreign capital is something that we need to address. There are several areas that are seeing phenomenal growth in our countries. In these, are, I, the, the, the nature of our economies are turning around in the way that it has done for all countries that have developed. Agric has reduced in terms of its share 
of the total gross domestic product. Services have overtaken everything else. And so tourism, banking services, um, um, uh, financial services, and digital services, telecoms, and all the like, are the biggest sector of the economy now and the fastest growing. Agric share has reduced uh, significantly. And that is, has been the nature of development for almost every country that has reached where it has reached. So it means that there's something happening and the number of people engaged in agriculture is reducing and more people are shifting into other sectors of the economy, which is uh, a good thing. But there are important areas like information technology and telecoms a lot of investments have gone in there, and that is a major growing part of um, um, the economy of Africa. And so for persons who are interested in investing, telecoms and IT, and lately fintech, payment, uh, uh, financial services have come onto their own payment platforms for people to be able to easily move money. Mobile money um, has taken its own um, uh, thing in, in Africa, and it's very fast growing. Tourism has always been an area, especially in East Africa. East Africa have made very good uh, opportunity of tourism, and they get some of the largest numbers, you know, especially because of the safari and nature con conservation that they have undertaken. Um, Agri-processing. Africa still has more than 60% of the world's remaining arable lands. And so there are opportunities to improve technology, to improve productivity, and be able to process you know, any extra food, both to feed uh, the demand in Africa and for export. And so that's a growing area. And I see a lot of people coming back and establishing commercial uh, agricultural uh, um, uh, projects and putting in the processing to process uh, for export and so that's an area. Mining has always been very important especially in Ghana, places like Congo and other places. I mean rare earth minerals, lithium, there's been a major discovery of lithium uh, in Ghana currently and you know a lease I hear has just been issued for it to start to be exploited and so that's an area. Construction, there's a, an infrastructure deficit and so companies that have the technology and capacity to be able to undertake power projects, road construction projects, building projects, bridges and so on and so forth all have a space in the African investment market. In, in um, the late 90s and 2000s there was the belief that Africa was rising because six of the fastest growing economies were to be found in Africa. And because of the wave of democratization that had taken place, many countries that had been under military rule had begun to um, return to constitutional democracy. There was great hope and excitement that this showed the turning point in Africa and that with democratization, free speech, freedom of association, freedom of movement, Africa was going to explode in terms of economic prosperity. That lasted until the world financial crisis uh, happened. And of course, th those shocks affected the whole world. If you remember, um, oil fell to about $38 a barrel. And uh, all commodities, cocoa, gold, everything, you know, dropped in value. And because Africa is a major exporter of raw commodities to the world, Africa took a, a shock and um, things unraveled. Global shocks will always occur. And what you need to do as an African economy is to make sure that you build the resilience to be able to go through the shock with minimal damage. And so COVID affected everybody, but the economies that are more resilient are recovering very quickly. And um, sometimes if you look at the growth in sectors, they are even faster than uh, pre-COVID. My country took a major hit from COVID, and that's because we had no buffers. We had overborrowed, you know, and so we had a debt crisis, you know, that was exposed by COVID. And so after COVID, I mean, it's like the pack of cards just crumbled and we had to crawl on our knees to the IMF, you know, for a bailout, which is currently uh, being disbursed, you know. But definitely the country still has potential. 
and with prudent management of the economy, we should be able to bring that country back on its feet. We need to cut expenditure. There is a certain temptation to give everything free, you know, and so there's a competition on who can give the freest things. But you, 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 you must have the wherewithal to be able to give things free, you know, and so. It's just for political capital, you want to make everything free, everybody should have things free. When you don't have the capacity to be able to uh, manage it, then it becomes a problem. I do think that we should have social safety nets that protect the poor and vulnerable. And my party is a social democratic party, so we believe that the fruits of growth should be shared equitably amongst all classes of society. But then, while you finance those social safety nets, you must make sure that you are raising the revenue to be able to make them effective. You know, it doesn't make sense to roll out uh, social interventions and not be able to fund it properly, and it doesn't give you the maximum effect and quality that you expect it to do. And so, managing our economics prudently, cutting out waste. I mean, there's a lot of waste, you know, in the system. In our, in Ghana, and because I come from Ghana, I normally use Ghana as an example. If you take the Auditor General's report every year, and you see how much money is misappropriated through procurement and all that kind of thing, we wouldn't need to go to the IMF if we're able to plug those holes. 17 billion CDs, you know, it's, it's either not accounted for properly and then you're going to the IMF for three billion over three years, one billion a year. And one billion is equivalent to about 11 billion CDs. And so it means you're wasting more than you're going to the IMF to beg for. And so prudent management of expenditure and cutting out waste, I think it's a way that African economies can make themselves more resilient. And also creating the buffers that make sure that when external shocks occur, you are able to survive, which is what my government to do, uh, sought to do through self-sacrifice. We put money in the stabilization fund, and it became, you know, very handy when COVID hit. Because when COVID hit, the government had no resources anywhere to begin the process of ameliorating the pandemic. And luckily, there was this stash of funds that was in the uh, stabilization fund. And so we said, go look in there, ask for parliament. The procedure is that you request it from parliament, and parliament will give the approval to use it. And so it was used to start the uh, fight against uh, COVID. We set up the sinking fund, which was a fund where we put aside some monies any time we want on the international capital market. We also put part of our oil revenues into that fund so that we were not surprised by any debt that became due for payment. And so as debts became due for payment, we used the sinking fund to amortize, amortize them. Um, we set up the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund into which we put seed money of $270 million and so that it could be the start of a sovereign wealth fund. Incidentally, most Ghanaians don't know it, but the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund that we set up financed 15% of the new airport terminal that we built, Terminal 3. And so that's one of the first legacy infrastructure uh, 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 projects that it invested in. And it was going to grow because some of the oil revenue was going to be put there and other sources of funding were going to go into that fund so that then we could use it to leverage investment to fix our roads. And when we fix the roads, we could toll the roads so that they are self-paying. Anybody who passes pays a toll. And it helps to pay back the investment that the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund would have made. You toll the bridges, you build the bridges and toll them. And so those are some of the things that um, African countries can do in order to improve um, um, the, the condition, the environment in which investment takes place. We also must prioritize. I mean, if you don't have the money, you don't go and buy a private jet for the use of the president. You know? And so you must put your money where your mouth is and make sure that every single dollar that we are spending as African countries is going into things that will directly benefit the, the people and directly uh, enhance the uh, prosperity of our nation. And so that's important. <coughs> then entrepreneurship, and that's what I spoke about at the Black Business Initiative yesterday. It is clearly the way to go. We need to encourage our young people that you can 
become an employer and not an employee. But then first we need to give them the skills to become entrepreneurs. And so entrepreneurship should become a part of our curricula, where we start to teach the children from an early age how to run and own businesses. Because if you take my country, Ghana, for instance, the number of people employed in the public sector is less than 700,000 people. And we have a population of 29 million. And so only 700,000 is in the public sector. If you take the whole formal sector, so that includes public and private sector, the whole formal sector, less than 20% of the population is employed in the formal sector. 80% is employed in the informal sector. And so it means that, and at, at the same time, you have almost 150,000 graduates coming out of university every year. And so how are you going to employ all these people? Employment is 13% at the moment. But amongst young people who have finished school, so, uh, sorry, unemployment is at about 13%. But amongst young people who have finished school, unemployment is currently above 25%. There are people who finished school four years ago and cannot find a job. They are sitting at home, staying with their parents, being fed by their parents. And so when we talk about the youth bulge and we say it is... Uh, uh, favorable to Africa and that we have a young vibrant labor force yes that's good but you are, if to have a young vibrant labor force you must be creating opportunities to use that labor force unfortunately our economies are not growing as fast as they should to create opportunities for these young people to be able to find jobs in the world of work and then that becomes a time bomb. It's no longer, you know, the advantage that you thought it, it would be. It becomes a ticking time bomb. Because as these young people find a lack of opportunities, and that's what happened in North Africa, uh, in Tunisia, when um, the young man, Bouazizi, um, set himself on fire and killed himself. And that led to a series of things that created the whole um, Arab Spring, that we call it, and changed the architecture of political leadership in North Africa, you know, permanently. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we're beginning to see it in the form of coup d'etats because when the coups happen who are those who jump on the streets and celebrate the removal of the previous government is the young people you see them on the streets dancing and happy you know but there's no evidence that military governments do better than civilian governments but i mean the point is in democracy you say they are participants in the democracy and so every four years you ask them to come and vote and so every four years they go and vote they queue to vote and if you go and talk to many of the young people in my country and in other african countries they say they don't see the reason why they should even vote because it's a waste of time because they don't see any improvement in the quality of their lives and so initially when soldiers take over they believe that oh we need some discipline we need some authoritarianism but when you get stuck with a bad military government, it's the worst thing you can ever have. Because you can't talk, you will be thrown into prison, you'll be beaten, you'll be killed. You know, at least you can exact accountability from civilian government. And so you can talk and you know, know that a constitution will protect your human rights. And if things don't change, you have the opportunity after four years or five years, depending on what the tenure is for governments in your country, to be able to vote that uh, administration out. And so some of the frustration of young people is beginning to show in their support for coup d'etats in Africa and the coup d'etats themselves because they exploit the frustration of the population to take over. And the other part of the frustration is being shown in their migrating out of Africa. And so first it was the unskilled crossing the Sahara and so on and so forth. But now a lot of the professionals, highly skilled, are looking for greener pastures elsewhere and leaving and especially the post COVID COVID took a toll on our economies and so most of the economies are now trying to climb out of COVID and um, it is uh, creating quite you know uh, uh, strong pressures on the middle class and the professionals and so many of them are beginning to leave and so entrepreneurship definitely because the public sector cannot employ everybody that you know needs a job the private sector 
should absorb the rest, but it's not growing fast enough. And so we need to see how to grow the private sector faster. It's not enough to say that the private sector is the engine of growth. Yes, it's the engine of growth, but it needs a steer, it needs ties, it needs, you know, uh, other things to be able to move, you know, the economy forward. And so that's an area that we need to look at. There was um, a program that we did um, in, in my country, and I think that, that those are some of the drawbacks of democracy. After I lost the election, the government that came in just chucked it and came up with another program of their own. But this was the Youth Entrepreneurship, Youth Entrepreneurship Support Initiative, and we gave seed money of 10 million. And we advertised it widely. It was not political. Any young person who had a business idea could apply. And so there were about more than 6,000 applications. And what we did was we got, you know, leading business people to go through the applications and guide them to set to uh, draw up feasibility studies. And so they submitted the feasibility studies. <coughs> and for the first cohort, we selected um, a little over 600 of them and um, invested in their businesses. And several of them were successful. Others, too, <laughs> you know, were not so successful. But I can talk of one of them that is still working. It's a young lady. She got the funding. Today, she exports share butter products and other products to UK, US, EU, and all other places. And um, she's exporting. Uh, her volumes are about 6,000, you know, 12.5 kilos of share butter products every quarter, you know, and she's employed directly more than 100 people and indirectly all the women who sell the share butter to her are also earning an income, you know, from it. And she's just one person. There are several others whose businesses were successful. And so these are models that we can use. Finally, African continental free trade area. It creates Im unimaginable opportunities for Africa. Currently, the trade amongst ourselves is 15%. It's the lowest in the world. In Europe, the trade amongst European countries is 60%. And so you can make a comparison. And so the African continental free trade area is meant to open up so that goods and services can move between countries. And I'm proud to say that it started to work. 55 countries have. Uh, all um, endorsed it, they've ratified it, and um, items are beginning to move between countries. I can uh, confirm that this year the first um, export of Kenyan tea came directly to Ghana. Formerly, we would have bought tea from we call, what do they call it? English breakfast tea. <laughs> Meanwhile, you don't grow any tea in England, uh, yet it's English breakfast tea. And most of those tea leaves in there are from Kenya. And they are good Kenyan tea brands, Kericho and all of them. And when I go to Kenya, I love to drink the Kenyan brands. But yet I come to Ghana and the tea is coming from English breakfast tea, Lipton and so on and so forth. So I can confirm that the first consignment of Kenyan tea came directly uh, to Ghana. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done because still the cards are rigged against Ghana. In, against Africa in terms of the structure of trade. For instance, the trade routes. You cannot ship items directly from one African country to another. There's no real connection. In some cases, the routes are not good. But even the shipping routes, if you want to ship from South Africa, your container might end up in Europe before it's shipped back to West Africa. And so those are all infrastructural and structural bottlenecks that we need to, to look at. So the Afghan continental free trade area gives us unimaginable possibilities, but we need to work on it in order that we're able to build up the amount of trade amongst us. They are looking at increasing trade to about 50% within the next two decades, which would be a very good thing. But then in addition to the free movement of goods and services, we also must look at the free movement of people in Africa. 54 countries, you need visas to move from one country to the other. You know, the goods can move, but the human beings can move. I mean, what's, what's the use of that? And until we have a free movement of labor and skills across the continent, it's going to be difficult for every country to compartmentalize itself 
with its own skills and be able to achieve the rate of development that it wants to. So thank you very much. With these few words, uh, I'm happy to be here with you again. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for taking the time to share your experience with us. It's an enlightening moment for many of us. This speech revealed insights and information. Thank you for the knowledge that you shared with us in this short period. Thank you so much. As we say in Canada, as you can see, the President knows what's up. <laughs> Based on the speech that he just given, um, as you can see, he gave us so much insights on uh, innovation, agriculture, tourism, trade and investment, IT, even fintech. You know, so he knows what's up. Um, he talked about cost savings initiatives, management of funds, which is very huge. So you know, um, let's all help to you know make Africa great again, as um, friends of Africa, we've been doing. So. Um, Let's continue to the next session of the program. So moving forward, as you all know, recently, um, CASA Foundation for International Development, under the leadership of Dr. Olutoi Oyalade, organized the 13th edition of the Friends of African Summit, which was a five-day summit. About 700 delegates registered for this event online and in person. Delegates joined from Canada and 42 countries around the world. So our next an agenda is to recap on the, some of the discussions that we had during the Friends of Africa 2023 summit that just happened. Um, so without much ado, let's invite Dr. Olutoin Oyalade to join me on the stage to do what we call the fireside questions and answers. It's called the fireside questions and answers, where we're going to be focusing on sustaining economic development through SMEs. A few questions that have been selected by leaders of thought. So let's um, give a round of applause to Dr. Alitoin as we proceed to the next program. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we're, we're going to make this as brief as possible. What we did actually at the Friends of Africa Economic uh, Summit over five days because we had announced, as you can imagine, we had advertised extensively that His Excellency will be coming and that if he's not able to come, uh, you know, just drumming support across, across the country. And if he's not able to join us, he will be there virtually. And so what we did was to collate as many questions. Questions started rolling in. I would like to do this, would like to do that. But apparently we didn't get that opportunity. But now that he's in town, we said to ourselves, let's collate a lot of these questions. But like you said just now, uh, His Excellency, Mr. President, knows what's up, right? Because a lot of these questions I see on my list have actually been addressed by some of the presentations that Mr. President uh, uh, gave. So what we're going to do quickly then is kind of summarize some of these questions. So we'll ask maybe the general ones, and then uh, we'll open the floor to questions. I, I bet we have quite a number of uh, investors, supporters, bankers in the room. I see, I see a lot of you. So we'll see if we can take maybe two or three questions, just about 30 minutes, so we don't, we know he, he's a very busy uh, person. So. We'll quickly do this. Uh, we already have met the president. He's been introduced. But uh, we still need to introduce the president, uh, the Casa Foundation way. And so, um, ladies and gentlemen, do permit us. This is what we usually do. And so we're going to um, just uh, roll a tape and introduce Mr. Mr. President to us again. Thank you. Thank you. But he can't see.
Beyond that, I'll continue to work for my country, I'll continue to work for Africa. But I'm saying it, it must be nice to be president. No, it's special. If you really... <laughs> I'm serious. If you really, if you really come to the presidency to work, you don't get a, day, a, a night's sleep. His Excellency was the fourth president of the Republic of Ghana between 2013 and 2017. Prior to that, he served as Vice President of Ghana from 2009 to 2012. His Excellency made history by being the first President of Ghana to serve in all levels of political office, including as a Member of Parliament, then Minister, and eventually President of Ghana. He is a communications expert, historian and writer, and the presidential candidate of Ghana's National Democratic Congress for the 2020 presidential election. All right, uh, so we welcome again His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Today you have addressed a lot of the issues and challenges that Ghana needs to address. Um, you kind of, it's, uh, you know, the presentation was like, you do have uh, a reformist agenda, as it were, and uh, that's something to look forward to. That will translate into uh, maybe the Ghana of your dream, the Ghana that we want, uh, and so on. So these objectives um, closely aligns with um, the strategic framework presented by the African Union through the ACTA that you just dis you know, discussed, um, which will be to transform Africa into the powerhouse of the future, integrate regional and continental uh, movement and transportation, and a continent that aims actually for inclusive and sustainable development, uh, driving a pan-Africanist agenda mandate. You talked about uh, you know, ensuring that uh, transportation is integrated. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that actually um, it, it sounded somehow, you know, because I, I do recall way back in 1996, I, I recall looking to travel from Nigeria um, to another part. I, I'm not sure if it's Equatorial Guinea or so. And it was like having my flight routed through a, an European country before landing back again to, to Africa making it capital intensive for people and so on. Of course, we do understand that there's uh, the continental, you know, the new road which is being, which is being funded by the IFC, um, the 53,000 53, kilometer road and so on to facilitate and fast track the integration of Africa in terms of transportation, in terms of the movement of people and so on. But the issue then is, um, based on a few, you know, the feedback that we have received, we work with AFTA, as a matter of fact, in 2021, His Excellency Wamkele Mene was actually the keynote speaker at Friends of Africa in 2021. And so he tried to address a lot of these issues. However, it looks like it's taken so long. Yes, 50% in 20 years, 50% of the mandate might be achieved. Now that we're talking about the new Ghana, what ideas would you have in terms of fast-tracking the implementation strategy of this reformist agenda that you perhaps might have on the table and that you're looking you know, to share with people? Uh, I, I, I don't think the uh, Ghana that we want, people can wait for 20 years, like we may have to wait for after. I, I, I hope you get um, that. So what would your ideas be, sir? Thank you, um, thank you very much. I'll say that... Um, the Africa of today is different from the Africa of 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There's progress being made and Africa is moving forward. The, our only difficulty is not moving at the pace that we wanted to move. Um, you talked about many of the problems that existed before. Before, if you made a call from Ghana to Nigeria, it was routed through Europe before you can speak to your neighbor in Nigeria. Today we have the optical fiber network. And so calls that are routed from Ghana go directly to, to Nigeria. That's big progress. We have the Glow Cable, SAT Cable. We have about three or four 
continental cables that crisscross West Africa. And so it makes telecoms much better. If you take air travel, today Ethiopian Airlines and Askai and some of the major continental uh, um, um, flyers make it possible to go directly from one African country to another without having to go through Europe like, like you experienced. And so if you come to West Africa, if you're going to Equatorial Guinea, Askai will take you there. Um, Seba will, will take you there. If you're going to any other part of um, Africa, the only thing is you transfer you transit through Bole Airport if you go with Ethiopian. But once you get to Bole Airport, anywhere in Africa you're going, they have a flight taking you there. So things are, are getting uh, better. We have the Lagos Abidjan corridor, which is part of what you talked about. IFC and other partners are all involved in that because the largest volume of trade in West Africa is between Lagos and Abidjan. So Lagos, uh, Cotonou, Lomé, Accra, Abidjan. And yet, the road is a wide network. If you take from Lagos to Badagri, oh my God, if you survive, then you survive the rest of the journey. That's the west part of the road. Incidentally, Nigerians, if you are here, you better get your act together <laughs> before even the expressway is built. And then, I mean, fairly good in uh, Cotonou, of course, because those countries are smaller, and so they have a smaller part of the thing, Togo. And then when you get into Ghana, it's good to Accra, but uh, after you pass Takrade to Cote d'Ivoire, that section of the road is bad. So if we have an expressway that allows you to drive directly from Lagos to Abidjan without going through all these customs checks and all these uh, I call them uh, tax, tax, tax barriers where they stop you and all they do is to fleece you. It's not about documents, not about anything. But an expressway that allows us to travel freely would, would improve things. Um, with, re with regards to reforms, reforms are necessary in every co uh, country. And I think that the priority I give is one political leadership. Leadership determines everything. If you have a leader who is determined to reform and move the country forward, you feel it and you see it. You know. The second is, like we said, to fix the infrastructure. I mean, when you're making a determination of where to invest, one of the things you want to know is that there's the infrastructure to invest. If there's no power, you can't invest. I mean, how do you build a factory when you don't have power to run the factory? If there's no water, you can't invest. If there are no roads to move your products or bring your raw materials in and move your products, I mean, no sane investor will go and put his, uh, uh, throw his money away in an investment in a place like that. And so we need to fix the infrastructure. And so that was the, one of the priorities that, you know, moved my government. We were fixing the roads, we were putting in the bridges, we did the airport, we built a new uh, port because. One day I flew out of Kotoka Airport, and I don't know where I was going, but the jet turned um, um, eastwards. And I was sitting on the left, and we flew past the old Tema port. And I saw a long queue of ships outside. And so when I got back from my trip, I asked the director of ports, I said, why do you have this long queue of ships? He said, so they are waiting to enter the harbor. And I said, why? Why that long? He said, so the harbor can take only, can bear four ships at a time. And so until the four of load and, you know, are loaded and they turn around, another ship cannot come in. So I said, so why don't we build a new port? Because this port was built for us by Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, our first president. And so we got the partners. We said, look, we want a new port. We want you to build it for us. We don't have the money, so you go find the money. And so the Ghana Parts and Harbors Authority and their partners, which was a partnership called MPS, raised the money on their own balance sheets, built a brand new, one of the most efficient ports you can find in West Africa. And today you go, there's, you don't see that kind of queue that used to exist when the old port was there. So these are transformational things that, you know, can help. And every president must have that vision that takes away the bottlenecks to uh, doing business. If business people are happy, you, the president, are happy. If business, your business people are not happy, you are also not happy. 
And so those are some of the things. Then digitalization, we must involve digitalization in everything. Take away human discretion from some of the things. And so you must digitalize your, your ports, you must digitalize your budget. And as you expend money and you pay for invoices and things, there must be a digital trail so that you eliminate all this petty corruption that exists. You know, those are some of the things that I think African leaders should take seriously in order that we're able to turn our fortunes around. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you. I do have, um, I'm, go I'm going to merge a few of those questions, all right? So, um, one of the major ones here that I will merge has to do with SMEs and youths, the youths of Africa. As we know, the youths of Africa constitute, uh, we know, 40% of the population, 1.2 billion population, 1.2 billion population, and um, under 25, very restless. This is very concerning to a lot of groups. Uh, accounting for about 85% of uh, crisis situations, riots, and so on, because they are unemployed. And so this is a major, this is a major, <laughs> well, this person said keg of gun, keg of gunpowder, he says. <laughs> uh, you know, so, but it's concerning. So that's one part of it. Uh, what would you be looking to do? How can they be engaged? We heard you talk about the seed investments and so on. I'm going to merge that question with the second one. And that question is the fact that um, the small and medium enterprises in the Western nations constitute, when you talk about their contribution to national economy, about 40, 65% uh, in the West. They are engaged properly groomed, supported by the government to ensure that they deliver to the nation. They are employers of labor, they are taxpayers, and they continue to function effectively in driving the agenda of each government, uh, you know, uh, when they come to power. This is not the case with Africa, generally speaking. From the Ghanaian perspective, what would you be looking to do? Uh, so those are the two questions. Uh, I'm sure they, they will be interwoven. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Welcome, um, small and medium enterprises have the greatest potential to move economies forward. Unfortunately, in Africa, they, you find them mainly in the area of trade and commerce. Mm. Most people who are able to deliver a little, uh, to, to raise a little capital are interested in going to China and bringing goods and selling or going outside somewhere and bringing goods and selling. It's like an import oriented thing. Very few people have the courage to invest that money in productive processes within the country. And I'll give you an example. A friend of mine was telling me a story. He set up a, a factory and um, one of the days he went to his sports club where he has friends. And um, they said, oh, we don't see you like this. He said, oh, my factory, I've been going and setting up the factory. And one of them said, ah, why, you're setting up a factory? What, what, what are you going to do? He says, I'm manufacturing, so I've forgotten what product it was. He said, oh, by you. It's Lebanese and Indians who build factories. You, Ghanaian, what are you building a factory for? Ours is to trade. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you have this kind of conception, you know, and so, yes, you go, the plastic factories that are producing the chairs and tables and things are owned by Lebanese and Syrians and, you know, Indians and so on and so forth, owned mostly by foreigners. Indigenous capital is not going into manufacturing. And that is some of what we need to look at. Small and medium enterprises have the potential, but they face many obstacles. Um, one they need training to be able to run a business you don't just get up and set up a business they need training they need succession planning there are sometimes a small enterprise builds becomes medium it's doing very well the owner drops dead now we have non-communicable disease hypertension diabetes and things the owner drops dead the family quarrels over the business and the business is gone tomorrow and so we don't have succession planning. That's one of the problems with those uh, uh, small and medium enterprises. But the most important thing is access to capital. The banking sector in Africa is not attuned to lending to small, lending to small and medium enterprises. And that's why 
I was sad when in Ghana, nine of our indigenous banks were closed. I'm sure you, if you follow what happened in Ghana, one of the major things that has created our debt crisis is that government shut down nine indigenous banks because it asked them to increase their capital reserve ratio to 400 million, and when the deadline reached and they couldn't uh, increase it, they shut them down. Now, these were the banks that were operating in the risky end of the market, lending to small enterprises because they knew how to do that kind of lending. The standard chartered and abscess of this world won't lend to that small trader who needs just a thousand CDs to, to trade. But those indigenous banks would lend, they know where the person stays, they know where their business is, and they will come and demand their money when it's time to pay. And so because they work in the risky end of the market, of course, their you know, um, uh, non-performing debts will be higher than the bigger banks. And so government should have cut them some slack, bought equity into them, put in management to help them iron out their ethical issues and principles of business, and then sell back the equity to them when they stand on their feet. Unfortunately, they just ordered them to shut down. And so now, unless you create a special purpose vehicle to be able to meet the needs of these uh, small and medium enterprises, then capital becomes one of the major things that they, they face. They don't have enough capital. For most of them, the capital is not enough. They have to use the capital to do business. And at the same time, they have to feed their families. If your child is going to school and the capital is there, and you don't have the money to pay fees, you take out of it and pay school fees. And so lack of adequate capital is a major constraint uh, to, to them. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those responses. Um, I will take one more question and then we'll open, we'll, we'll open the floor for additional questions. Uh, Mr. President, Ghana, the Republic of Ghana recently secured a $3 billion loan from the IMF. Um, so, you know, uh, just taking the cue from, you know, your comments on uh, capital, access to capital and so on, do these loans really help? Uh, would, it, would it actually help the populace, you know, the small businesses that we're talking about? Uh, or will it just simply increase the debt burden um, that we see now, you know, Ghana deficits, crisis situation with capital and so on, we hear yet it was a darling of uh, nations uh, just a few months, you know, a few years back. Um, so w what's your opinion on that? And in addition to that question, there's a central concern of political risk. Is this tied, uh, is this expected to mitigate that in a way? Um, if you could take those two together, then we'll open that. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'm ashamed to say we went back to the IMF for a bailout. Um, Everybody was praising Ghana. Yeah. That's an economic miracle. Ghana is doing well and all that. But the red flags had begun to show from as early as 2018, um, when we came out of the IMF program, the Minister of Finance had a kinky party in the ministry because then his hands were free to be able to run the economy <laughs> the way he wanted. And he went on a boring spree. And when you borrow like that, the bulk of that money should go into production, it should go into infrastructure, it shouldn't go into consumption. And so many of us raised the red flag and said, look, you're going to create a crisis because in four years he borrowed $11.5 billion, not CDs, dollars in four years. $11.5 billion. And the question Ghanaians ask is, what have you done with all this money? Most of it has gone for budget support because he was running a deficit. And that's why I say expenditure management is important. Cutting down waste. For instance, we had 125 ministers, the largest number in the world, I suppose, because I don't know any other country that had more ministers. And for every minister, you provide a house, you provide two cars, a four by four, a saloon car, you pay his electricity bills, water bills, telephone bills, even DSTV bills, you pay. You know, you pay his fuel, and so you have 125 ministers. And then our president, we had a presidential jet, I used it, you know, it doesn't have a bathroom, but it's fine. You know? 
It doesn't have a bed, but it's fine. I could recline my seat and sleep and wake up in the morning. I present uh, insisted on chattering a bigger plane with a shower and a bed and all that, you know. And so, expenditure control is important. And this was self-inflicted. I can say unequivocally that this current return to IMF was self-inflicted. If I managed things better, I would have gone into COVID more resilient. Unfortunately, we went into COVID without any buffers, you know. And when we went into COVID, there was an inflow of funds. One, we took money from the stabilization fund. The IMF gave us $2 billion, $1 billion first in SDRs, and then $1 billion uh, uh, loan, long-term loan. Uh, African Development Bank gave us money. Um, EU gave us money. In all, about 22 billion CDs came into the economy because of COVID. How was that money, money managed? It coincided with an election year, and so of course most of it went into political patronage to be able to win the election. And so this IMF we went into was self-inflicted. And so we went on our knees begging, and IMF grudgingly agreed to uh, give us a bailout of three billion. The money is meant to um, allow us to restructure our debt. Because our debt, when I left office, our debt to GDP was 57%. Uh, By the time we went to the IMF, our debt to GDP was 103%. And that's how exponentially our debt had grown. And so we declared a default. And Ghana, so that means Ghana declared a default, essentially saying that we're bankrupt. And so the IMF should come and bail us out. So right now we suspended uh, all debt payments, both domestic and external, and we are restructuring the debt profile. But I mean, we've started to raise concerns because our party is it's a likely candidate to win the next election. It means that any things that are not done properly now would be inherited by us. And so we've started raising the red flag because what they're doing is kicking the debts down the road. Right now, no debts are being paid. IMF is front-loading two-thirds of the three billion in one and a half years, and only one third will be available to the next government. And in 2026, 2027, debt repayments are going to start. And so you are using one third of the money at a time when you are going to have to start servicing debts again, and then spending two thirds of it when you have suspended, you know, debt repayments. And so, so those are all some of the things. And so recently we wrote to the IMF and said, look, we need to have a discussion because this your program is going to transcend regimes. And so you cannot just be talking with the current government. You must be talking to uh, potential stakeholders, potential governments that will come. And so we had a discussion with them. We put our concerns to them, and it's my hope that they would um, um, look at it. But it's the price we pay for democracy. Governments come, governments go. And often, sometimes when government comes, there's a lack of continuity in the programs that have been implemented. There's a lack of continuity in the prudence management of the economy, you know. And so it's, it's, it's democracy. And it leads you to the question, is democracy first or development first and democracy later? We all speak uh, brilliantly about Lee Kuan Yew. Today, Kagame is the toast of Africa, Rwanda. But at what expense? Freedom of expression, uh, political rights, and human rights, and so on and so forth. And so for the democratic countries, progress is slower. But I think that it's more sustainable. Whatever progress you make is more sustainable. Because if you have an autocratic uh, administration, remove the autocrat and sometimes things just unravel, you know. So these are things that we need to look at. I think that we need to continue to build the faith of our young people in our democracy. That still, if you have a democratic government, it's the best, you know, form of government. And everybody should participate to make sure that things work out. Thank you so much. Thank you for those uh, answers. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we, the floor is now open for questions, and uh, we will be able to take uh, maybe three questions. We're just trying to make good time here. So let's see how that goes. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
All right, we have some bankers in the room. I'll start with the bankers. <laughs> Adi, yes, I'll start with the bankers. Um, um, do we do have, uh, yeah, you can use this. Thank you. Uh, you can tell us your name, your bank account, Good morning, everyone. Thank you, His Excellencies. Uh, uh, we appreciate uh, this speech. Uh, it took us all back home. Um, you spoke about the importance of SMEs. Um, that is vital to the development of the African economy. Um, because the West has got a very solid structure of 90% uh, of businesses are SMEs. And they, generated, they generate over 50% uh, they create over 50 percent of jobs so this is vital and you spoke about some of what um, your government uh, is happening in ghana concerning driving this because of the recognition to the uh, contribution of smes to the growth of the of, of the country and then you talk about tax holidays uh, which is one of the issues supporting foreign uh, companies against the indigenous ones I, i'm just my question is just that uh, what are other policies and reforms that you have identified or that is going on in Ghana uh, currently to really give the SMS, SMEs the kind of platform they need, reforms, policies they need to try so that they can create a job since governments can employ the youth and things like that so that maybe that can be exported to other African countries too or we can copy from that. We just want to learn, I would like to learn more about what is happening in terms of reforms uh, to help to support MSMEs. Okay. Thank you. I think no, if, you, if you can hold it, we'll take uh, like three questions and then we'll have uh, Mr. President answer if you pass it that way. Uh, yeah, so that's one thing. Is that you? Oh, you're there. One there. Uh, okay. So we'll take three at a time so that we don't have too many. And the lady in blue. Thank you very much. My name is the Prophet Daniel Asamwalabi, uh, President of the Worldwide Council of the Prophetic Alliance and also um, founder of House of God International Prayer Ministry. I have this particular uh, burden that uh, it bothers me a lot and first of all His Excellency we thank God you are here and my answer will definitely be answered I believe <laughs> because I've tried it several times and I'm not getting the answer okay. um, first of all during your term uh, as a president of Ghana uh, if I stand to be corrected you were able to elevate the tertiary institutions into the grade of the university level and as you were spoken um, about innovation and technology one of the things that bothers much is that we have a great man of God in Ghana Emeritus Apostle Kujosafo who has been using even a, a tributarium an anthill to develop a car engine he has been developing cars and a whole lot of things and even giving some of the cars to government officials and the police to use it and see how effective it is we have seen that so many governments has come and gone and currently there is no any good impact from capital investment for his side and the youth also need training to learn how to do technology and a lot of things first of all i believe and i surely believe that you will come back again and what is your plan for Kantanka Group and um, secondly we know a lot of money has gone through in the government today in Ghana so many ministers are having serious money in their bedrooms um, playing tea one thing I just want to say is that you were saying that there's no money in the system and you are coming back by God's grace uh, are you going for accountability ways and means you are going to collect the money back and use it to help the country thank you <laughs> um, right, we'll have, uh, the lady in blue. 
Uh, and I just wanted to say that we keep the questions short and sharp so we can take uh, a few more. So that will be the last of the and then uh, we'll take Thank you so much. My name is Evelyn Sapon. I'm a registered nurse, CEO of One Touch Home Healthcare and um, One Touch Educational Complex. My question is on health. As we all know, Mr. Ex President, the health issues, the health system in Ghana is very poor. Very, very poor. I will rate it like 25%. Because of that, most people from the other countries are even scared to come and live there because if they are sick, they don't know where to go. No infrastructure, no resources, nothing. People are dying. So many people are in the hospitals, sleeping on the floors, even in the maternity, babies on the floors. We can see and hear them every day. And it's not yesterday, it has been since my grandma was born, up to now. And so many different presidents have come, they will talk, they will talk, but there is no practicum. They will just give us the theory and that's it. What is your intake in the healthcare system? And the next one I will add is, what do you think about implementing home health care? in Ghana. Practical one, not just theoretical one. Thank you. What do you say? Home health care. Home health care. Whereby patients will be, will be sent home, nurses and physicians can attend to them to relieve the pressures in the hospitals. Because there are no beds in the hospitals. They can come home, nurses can come home, and the government has to make sure they take good care of the nurses and the physicians to be able to sacrifice to do this job because it is helping this country. Home health care is very good and it's supporting the country very well. How do you implement this? Thank you. We're done? Yeah. Oh. Okay, all right. Um, just quickly. Thank you. Um, let me start with the healthcare question. Um, I think it's a question of management. And then also, it is um, a question of development not keeping pace with population growth. And so, if you take um, the urban centers, especially, um, the urban centers are growing very quickly in Ghana. We've moved from over 75% rural, 25% urban, to a majority urban. Currently, it's about 52% urban, 48% rural. And so, if forward planning is done, then it means that we should be putting in more facilities in the urban centers to soak up the, the pressure. And so, with that in view, as president, let's take on Greater Accra alone, which is the capital region, we realized that the only existing main hospitals were Kolibu, which was built in our colonial times, called in Gagesbeck's time, but is a specialist hospital. And then you had Rich Hospital, which was also the European hospital. That's where the white colonialists used to go. Blacks were not allowed to go there until independence. And so Rich Hospital was the second uh, major hospital. After that, you had small hospitals like Lekma Hospital, uh, Labadi Polyclinic, and so on and so forth. And so people, and then we also had 37 military hospital, and then Ligon Hospital. And so people were dying because they could not get beds somebody took his father around all the hospitals and couldn't find a bed for him and his father died in his car and so with that in mind we said look we need to build additional hospitals in the urban centers in order to soak up the pressure and so i started the Ghana east hospital i built the Ghana east hospital i built the dodoa hospital which has won repeatedly one of the best hospitals in the world they've got a lot of uh, no infants died in a certain year no maternal mortality they're doing very well that's the Shao Sudoku district hospital we built um, uh, the new uh, uh, rich hospital which we call the greater Accra regional hospital we expanded it into a modern hospital and 
because of that people who used to come from Dodoa and from Medina and other places no longer have to do that because then there are hospitals that are standard they have um, MRI they have x-rays they have everything everything that you go to Kolebu or um, 37 to do you have in your uh, hospital in your suburban area and so it eased the pressure a bit but like I said the population continues to grow and so you need to continue to expand the health facilities we put in a modern hospital which is the university of ghana medical center ugmc and it is one of the best hospitals you can find in africa and we put it in because we found that a lot of ghanaians were going outside to seek medical care for cancers, for renal diseases, for um, uh, brain surgeries, for so on and so forth. And so we put that hospital in. And when I commissioned it, I said, we're putting this hospital so that all of us, president, ministers, everybody, if we need care, we will come here instead of wasting our re uh, Ghana's resources going out to South Africa or India. And so that hospital is there. Unfortunately, government changed. It's not been operationalized the way we expected. Only a percentage of the hospital is being used. Its full potential is not yet being um, uh, exploited. And so these are some of the problems we face. In the other regions, Tamale, we expanded the teaching hospital. You know, we built, we started the Formina Hospital, Kumau Hospital, uh, uh, Sewa Hospital, Afari Ministry, Military Hospital, Abetifi Hospital. I mean, so many of them in order to expand access. The major thing with healthcare is one, the human resource professionals, two is the facilities, and three is access. One, and the most important is access. People should have a hospital within a certain number of kilometers from them so that they are able to access the hospital. Two, the healthcare facility must be good enough to provide them quality health care. And three, the human resource, the professionals there must know what they are doing to be able to diagnose and treat a patient. Those are the three things that you need to concentrate on. And so those are what we concentrated on. But we have this humongous state uh, institution called the Ghana Health Service, and they manage and run the hospitals. And I don't think that the standard of management is what one would, 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 would want. And so we need to look at how we can encourage you know, better management of the hospitals. There are hospital administrators who can be appointed. There are even hospital management companies that are private. You can appoint them to run a, a public hospital, and they'll run it efficiently. And so those are some of the innovations we should think about. It doesn't mean if it's a public hospital, it must be run by a public institution. You can have private uh, uh, management running a hospital and running it efficiently. Home care, we haven't reached the standard that we have here. We have the public health nurses and the community health nurses who visit the, um, uh, uh, the homes and communities, but it's more about preventive care than uh, curative care. And so we haven't reached that stage yet. For most of those I've heard having home care is people who can afford it because then there are companies, private companies that have the nurses and if you have your aged mother and she's at home and she needs care, then you have to go there and pay them to uh, supply you the nurses to look after them. We haven't reached where you've reached yet, but we do have a system of public health nurses who go and do preventive uh, um, uh, medicine in the communities in which they are posted. Then um, the next one is um, reforms to help SMEs. One of the major achievements that we were able to push through was in terms of helping SMEs start up, creating one-stop shops and reducing the time it took for people to register their businesses. And so now it's easier to register a business. It takes uh, a very short time when you want to register a business. You get your tax identification number and everything. You know, Like I said, the main bottleneck is still access to capital to be able to establish your business. And if we're able to get that right, you know, I think that we should be home and dry. One of the things that we've not been successful in doing in Africa and Ghana is cooperatives. You know, cooperatives are when several people come together, bring their resources together, and set up businesses and run them. And you share the profits. But 
I don't know about the other African countries, but in Ghana, everybody wants to be a managing director of his own business. And so nobody is prepared to come into a cooperative, you know, put your resources together and then be able to use it to finance, you know, your businesses. So that's an area that I think we can look at. And um, I saw it work when I went and spoke to the BBI, the Black Business Initiative. Um, one of the major uh, sponsors was the Nova Scotia Cooperative, you know, uh, something. And they spoke about, you know, how they cooperate to help businesses and all that. And I think that it's a model that we can take from here and send back, encourage our business people to come together. All of you contribute this amount of money. What are the businesses you want to invest in? You know, and it makes it. We have the traditional form of it. We call it susu. Yeah, yeah where everybody big gives a little money and they put it together and give it to one person and then the next time the money is given to another person you know but the circle breaks when one runs away with the money and <laughs> <laughs> and it's happened in several circumstances so when one runs away with the money then it breaks the whole thing you know and so um, those are some of the things that we can look at um, with the last one um, let's see um, yeah, yeah, um, the um, Apostle yes. Kojo Safo. You know, when you say God gave you a vision and you took an anthill and built an engine, I mean, no bank will give you money. <laughs> you get my point. Uh, to build a car, you must build a car. You need metal foundries. You must make the engine. You must get the pistons. You must do this. Or, I mean, if it's an electric car, you must do the circuitry and all that. It's all science-based, you know. And so, I was in the first government of Rawlings, and I remember that is when a delegation was sent to see how he can be helped, you know. But he told us it's divine you know and I mean there's no way <laughs> if it's divine then God will give the capital to to do to do it you get my point so we couldn't get proof of what really to help him with but his son has taken over the business and his son says it's an assembly plant we're importing the components and we're building the vehicles and so government has started to buy to buy Kantanka cars I mean I've seen the police service using several of his pickups and, and things like that. And so I think that that is a first step. And once, I mean, we know that it's an assembly plant, and several assembly plants are coming up. You know, Japan Motors has built an assembly plant. There's an assembly plant for uh, uh, assembling uh, big trucks, dump trucks, and so on and so forth. So this is one of several that are operating. And government is trying to put in the facilities that will help them to sell because we have a big used car market with you know hundreds of thousands of um, second hand cars being imported from all over the world and then what it does is that because the prices are lower people prefer to buy them than to buy a new one and so I think government is trying to put in some restrictions to assist those plans but I think rather than putting those restrictions government should set the example say that government is the biggest spender in the economy and so say that we're not going to buy import any vehicles any vehicle government will buy will buy from the local those who are assembling uh, in, in Ghana and that should give them a huge market enough to be able to make their businesses run and so I think that that's where government should start from and once government starts to set an example by buying its own locally manufactured vehicles then others will follow suit and do the same thing and then um, money in bedrooms <laughs> he's talking about an incident where um, a, a minister's a minister reported to the police that uh, domestic helps had stolen millions of dollars from the bedroom and the question is why why would you have that kind of money in your bedroom but it's a case that is before the courts and so as a political leader I should be very careful about how to comment on it but it raises squarely the issue of corruption um, the thing is corruption would occur even in the most advanced uh, democracies I mean today 
we were looking at U.S. and talking about Senator Menendez, the head of the Foreign Relations Committee, and they found evidence that he accepted monies from a foreign government to influence policy. And so it will, it will happen, but the difference is that in the U.S., the FBI has gotten involved. He's under, you know, uh, investigation, very serious investigations, you know. That is the difference. In our context, corruption occurs there will be interference in the, in the anti-corruption agencies. There will be attempts to obstruct them from investigating. There are people who even defend the person who has, you know, been involved in, in corruption. And that's the difference, the culture, you know. Co the fight against corruption, first and foremost, is about the political will to fight it. It will occur. But when it occurs, you must let the agencies that deal with corruption go ahead and do their job. That's it. And um, sometimes in our context when you do that, then it's even used as evidence of corruption against your government. You know, I had several cases investigated. For instance, there was this youth program, JIDA, and there were accusations and allegations of corruption in JIDA. So when I came, I set up a commission of inquiry, and we found a lot of malfeasance. And I said, publish the report and let everybody see, you know, the malfeasance that was found. Oh, then my political opponents took it. And you see, we said he's a corrupt person. The, pres the, the government is corrupt, <laughs> you know, and of course, um, it, it was used as a, a baton to hit, to hit us on the heads. But... I mean, there are several cases that we investigated from that JIDA report. My own colleague, who I was in parliament with, you know, we put him before trial. He was sentenced. He went to jail. I, I felt sad, but, I mean, we had to let the process work. And with what has happened, I mean, Ghanaians are expectant, and it can be business as usual. And so I tell my colleagues, I said, look, if we go into government again and we win, Ghanaians are not going to tolerate this business as usual. We must make a change. And so as a leader, the anti-corruption agencies will work. And if they catch you, there's nothing that I as president can do to save you. You know, you'll have to face the music. So everybody must, you know, work selflessly and make sure that they give their best. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I see a lot of hands. I, I see a lot of hands. We'll only take one last round, meaning we take three questions together, and um, Mr. President would have uh, the answers. So uh, we'll, we'll go round again. Uh, the lady, the gentleman, so one, two, and three, the last one over there in blue. All right, so one, two, three, and then we'll, that will be the final round. Grand Rising. My name is Imani James. I'm the founder of Organic Soul Healing Arts, and I often bring this issue to most business meetings. <laughs> um, yesterday, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with uh, Nene Kwasi Kafele, and we were working on building a community matrix um, based on the foundation of building capacity. And I'm just wondering, we, we t took a look at the Adinkra symbols and African traditions and Afrocentric uh, foundation. And I'm also from Nova Scotia, so I've re recognized that we also have built a lot of economic advancement in our communities in, in Halifax based on reaching back and gathering African traditions. So my question to you is, how relevant is this um, the spirituality and African traditions to leveraging the economic and trade partnerships that we can do? Um, be a part of. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for coming to this program. My name is Moses Ajay, and I'm an engineer by profession. With your vision, how are you going to eliminate Ghana debt? With your, um, secondly, what will your manifesto? to overcome the insolvency of Ghana? And number three, what will be your guide rail to protect a country like Ghana to prevent misabuse of expenditure?
Good morning, Your Excellency. My name is Gabriel. I have a two-part question for you. The first one is, um, as long as I've been in Ghana, I realize as youth, as young as 12 years old, on the street and selling products or looking for money, um, while they should be in class instead. So is there some kind of a program that's designed to get these youth off the street? Um, and my second question is uh, affordable housing. Also as well, there's a huge deficit of affordable housing in Ghana, and sometimes I'll see government buildings or other infrastructure that could be used for affordable housing, but it's abandoned and it's not being used. So there are also some of the program to make sure these affordable housings are being made as well as being used. Thank you. Thank you. That's generous of you. Yeah. Um, so we'll start with affordable housing. Um, housing is one of the major um, challenges for most families in, in Africa and um, in Ghana. Um, indeed, it is the biggest expenditure of the household. Um, we face a deficit of in excess of 1.5 million homes. And so in Ghana today, if you get a rental, you're likely normally to pay two years rent advance upfront, even though the law says you shouldn't pay more than six months. But I mean, you need the property and he'll give it to you. He says pay two years. And um, people will not insist on their rights. They would pay just to have a roof over their heads. Most of the houses in Ghana are built by private real estate developers and um, most of the material used in production are foreign sourced and so by the time you bring in those construction material you pay the duties and levies at the port and by the time you use them to construct add the issue of labor and all the other local charges to it uh, quarry uh, stones uh, sand and all the things that you need the price often is beyond the pocket of most families and so over the years we have continued to say how do we integrate local construction material so that we can bring down the cost of houses and I've seen it in, uh, in, in, in uh, South Africa where they use very little cement, mostly uh, laterite, and then they compact it and they use interlocking blocks and so they don't even put mortar in the middle, you know. And there are indigenous ways of doing it so that you can bring down the cost of housing. Um, with the social housing um, concepts that we have used in the past, they have involved sometimes high-rise apartments and so on and so forth. And um, the last example, when I came into office, we inherited it from previous administrations and we asked the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, which is our Social Security Fund, to take it over and finish it. And so when they did the costing, eventually a two-bedroom apartment came out at $50,000. And I mean, fifty thousand dollars. I mean, very few um, of the Ghanaian, you know, lower-income uh, households can afford to be able to purchase. So, how do we bring down the cost even more? That is a challenge that we all must uh, uh, think about. There was a model that was done in um, in Tamale, and um, it was done by the municipal assembly. And when they finished building the property. At the time, which was about 2016, they could sell one of those houses for 15,000 CDs, which is very affordable. And so it's a model that we should scale up. Unfortunately, even though we use it as a pilot, it's not continued because we wanted other assemblies to come and take a look at that model and see how they could use part of, we have what we call the District Assemblies Common Fund to allocate part of that fund to housing and build that model for sale to teachers and nurses and other people who work in the in the district. So it's something that we can take up again to make sure that you know housing is um, improved, access to housing. 
like most African cities, and I'm sure that uh, doctor is familiar with it in, in Lagos. I mean, we have street hawkers. <laughs> and um, these are little businesses, young people who have dropped out of school or don't go to school, engage in. The rules of the municipality prohibit street hawking, but you must look at it from a humanitarian point of view too that if you didn't allow that to happen how many more families would suffer and not be able to put food on the table and so while you try to restrict it you do it in the sense of the fact that you're doing it humanely but aside from that the worry is those of school going age that are on the streets and that is a matter to do with the families because in Ghana, you don't pay to go to a, a basic school. We have free compulsory investor basic education. And because of that, we're able to achieve more than 97% primary school enrollment and gender parity. As many boys as girls were enrolled in primary school. But how to keep the children in school is what should engage us next. And government cannot do it unless we collaborate with the families to let them and know that, look, we made this school free so that your ch child will go to school. And so if your child is playing the truant and not going to school, you have a responsibility to hold them by the ear and drag them to the school and hand them over to the teacher. You know, and so these are so on. But we also have um, children who probably are orphaned, they are not integrated into other families, and so they sleep on the streets. We call them street children. And there are several NGOs that are working with them. The social, uh, Department of Social Welfare also does some of that work to try and see how they can get those kids off the streets. There are orphanages that uh, some of them are put in where they can get care and be able to attend school at the same time. But it's a social prog problem that afflicts not only Africa. I think even in the developed world, you would have some of those issues of homeless people, you know, young people who have drifted from home and all that kind of thing. So those are issues of concern to any government. The point is, if you create opportunities, if you grow your economy, if, you know, uh, the society is prospering, then it reduces the number of these uh, uh, deviants that, that come out on the streets. And so that's something we should look at. And then, um, how do you um, ensure that um, you resolve the issue of debt? I think that we must legislate. We must put legislation. We have the Pu Public Financial Management Act. I think we need to amend it and put in something that regulates how much the country can borrow at any time. We have it for how much we can borrow from the central bank. You cannot borrow more than 5% of previous year's revenue from the central bank. So that is regulated. And so in the same manner, you cannot borrow more than a setting percentage of your GDP growth in a year from the international capital. We have to find something so that tomorrow you don't have a finance minister who, because you have access to the market, you just go and borrow like there's no tomorrow. You know, there's been prudence in borrowing. I mean, in the four years I was uh, a, a president, we went on the euro bond market and we borrowed 3.5 billion for over four years, and most of it went into infrastructure uh, de development. And so, even in the final year, we needed 750 million for budget support to pay contractors for work done for government, to pay government suppliers, and so on and so forth. And so we went on to the uh, Eurobond market for 750. We were oversubscribed by two billion. There were two billion dollars worth of offers. But out of prudence, we said, no, we're going to take only 750. And so we took 750 that year and left the 1.25 billion. In the first year of the new finance minister, he went for a certain amount. It was oversubscribed. He took the extra oversubscription. You know, even though that is not what he went for. Let's say he went, for example, he went for two billion and he was oversubscribed by three billion. He took the extra money, and that is what has landed us here. So there must be a regulation that restricts, you know, borrowing, and that we restrict it so that we don't borrow excessively. I think that we can develop more sources of financing indigenously. 
if we look at our expenditure it's not excessive there must be expenditure controls and if we also look at raising our revenues because when you i mean the whole thing about financial management is like you run your home public financial management is just like running your home you cannot have income x and have expenditure y and have a deficit of say 10 percent every year you have to fill that deficit somehow and so you either have to take another job to increase the revenue and then you need to cut down the beer you drink in the pubs with your friends you know you need to reduce the number of shoes your wife buys her handbags her cloths you know postpone buying a new bicycle for kojo you know and things like that so that you can balance your revenue and expenditure and if you're able to do that then you build your economy you build your household if you go out and borrow it must go into something that is productive for the family for instance the roof is leaking you use that money to put a new roof on the house you know the bathroom the plumbing is bad you use that money to fix the plumbing and then it gives a direct benefit to the household but if you go take that extra money and you buy pieces every evening you buy wine red wine and you toast with your wife every evening i mean that's not the right way to use you know money that you have gone to borrow so these are things that i think we should look at and um how do the thing about african traditions and spirituality i'm not an expert there but uh, i'll say that one of the things that some countries have done very well is that in modernizing they have leveraged their own culture and traditions in the modernization process and i worked with the japanese and so i always use them as the example japan is one of the most modern societies but it's also one of the most traditional and cultural societies and so they have this code of conduct they have how people should behave and all that i mean i went to japan and i was we, we went for a training program and so we were foreigners from all over the world and we had gone out shopping and we're walking and uh, there was somebody there were some people ahead of us and somebody had thrown a chocolate wrapper on the floor uh, i'm sure it's a foreigner a japanese won't do that and the guy who a japanese guy who was following him you know saw the chocolate wrapper on the floor he picked it up and he walked to the next litter bin and he put it in you know how many of us would do that we'll just i didn't throw it there just walk past it well the city council will come and clean it up you know so they have imbued their culture into um, their, their way of life and i think it's a it's a good thing we and they're very disciplined we went for a night out we came we were going back to the hotel there's a zebra crossing we stood at the zebra crossing there was a japanese couple there when we got there and they were waiting because it was red it was like 1 a.m in the in the night and so we wondered why they were standing we looked left looked right there was no car in sight anywhere and they were standing and waiting for the light to turn green and so i mean foreigners we just started walking across the zebra crossing and because they were deep in in conversation they didn't look at the lights they saw us crossing so they assumed that it was green and so they started crossing with us and then halfway one of them said no but the light is still red you know they turned around and walked back <laughs> and unfortunately for them by the time they walked back it turned green and so they, <laughs> but i mean that's them you know in africa we have traditions that we have jettisoned they say don't go to the forest on tuesdays because the spirits are resting it was their way of telling us that the forest needs to recover and so don't go cutting wood or disturbing the forest on one day of the week you know and we jettison all that people on it was most places tuesdays where people will go into the forest and say oh forget the gods you know but you don't realize that you are destroying it for yourself you are destroying it for your children and your children's children you know and so these are traditions that are people out of their own traditional wisdom you know brought into play when we were growing up as kids we didn't have you know uh, lotions that were imported 
share butter after they bathed us they would rub us with share butter you see us shining like a penny a new penny <laughs> and yet it was very good for our skins you know and if you had scratches and they put share butter in it it would heal like magic you know and then modern society uh, started with all these cosmetics and things full of chemicals and all that and we jettisoned our share butter it's only now that people are beginning to realize that oh share butter has cosmetic uses because the same you know uh, foreign cosmetics that are being shipped to us are buying huge amounts of share butter and mixing you know to create a better and we had the pure raw form which has all the medicinal properties and all that and so more people are discovering that look some of these things that our forefathers you know discovered are important and we don't need to uh, throw them away and so i think that it's something that we should continue to explore thank you Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm sure I speak, I speak uh, the minds of everyone in the room today, our business leaders, our investors, and community leaders, uh, that we've had such an enlightening, uh, very illuminating and insightful session with uh, Mr. President. Our, our goal is that... Uh, <laughs> thank you. Our, our goal is that uh, we want to present leaders of his ilk, you know, um, Pan-Africanists, people who, can, who we can bank on their words to deliver on the agenda, you know, the AFTA agenda, the agenda 2063, um, you know, to promote the Africa that we want and believing that that can be realized in the Republic of Ghana. Thank you again, Mr. President, for joining us uh, this morning at Friends of Africa Post Summit uh, session. And I'm now going to hand over to the MC. But before I do that, may I kindly invite uh, Dr. Jean uh, to present uh, a gift and a token uh, to Mr. President. Thank you. Just remove it. Remove it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Would you? Do, do you want to come? Oh, oh be careful. <laughs> it's the color of red. <laughs> Mr. President, a gift from all of us here. And uh, we want to recognize your presence, recognize your contribution, and recognize how much this discussion is important to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> I'm sure you're all curious. Okay, well, let me open it so that, in the interest of transparency and accountability. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> I was going to find a place on the wall in my office, yeah? And I remember Casa anytime I see it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sir. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Olu. Thank you, Mr. President. Very insightful and thoughtful. We were all very excited. It's been amazing. This morning has been very great. At this point, I would like to, uh, on behalf of everybody, thank uh, everybody for joining us today. Um, it's been an insightful morning. Um, thanks to Casa Foundation, of course, um, Friends of Africa Coalition, GCCC, and Afro Black organizers who are here today. It is now time for breakfast, uh, networking breakfast. So, uh, networking. So, if you could, if you can please. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's a breakfast lunch. So, it comes with everything. <laughs> because it's already, yes. <laughs> So, if you can please, um, you know, just across on the hallway, there's um, breakfast and lunch mix of everything served there. So, you can go grab yours and then join us back here.
So in the meantime, um, you can do your networking and then um, we'll proceed from there.